Can you guys hear me? All right, cool. All right, we're, we're recording. All right. Hey, how you guys doing? Today I have the pleasure of introducing G, a Philadelphia native. G pursuit of strength and conditioning began in high school when he had the opportunity to work alongside newly hired strength coach, Death Deratoti Deratoto at William Penn Charter High School. Later while attending Ithaca College, pursuing a bachelor's in science of clinical exercise science, he interned at Cornell University and worked, a, a worked at a local strength and conditioning gym. Immediately after graduating, G worked countless hours and nights driving Lyft while, while building a clientele and saving up enough money to start his own gym. What began as G's training, what began as G training clients in a studio apartment grew into what we know now as G Strength. Introducing G from G Strength. How are you doing, man? Good, man. Happy to be here. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess I guess I should start with uh, how I got into strength and conditioning and like what kind of got me started there. Um, I was always, and this is most of my life, I was always kind of like a mediocre average athlete. So I was always trying to like stretch out any ounce of performance I can get any way I could. And naturally, you know, I found the gym and it didn't take long for me to really like fall in love with it. I mean, I think when I was like 15, I'd, I'd go to the gym down the street and do the same workout every day. I didn't really know what I was doing, but you know, I just liked how it made me feel. And um, I noticed I was getting bigger and stronger. So um, I would just kind of do my own thing until eventually, uh, eventually I started, you know, I, got, I would get cut from my teams in high school. I think I you know, got cut my freshman and junior year uh, at St. Joe's prep. And, uh, you know, I started looking for professional help. I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. You know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get some training with regard to the sport I'm playing with regard to baseball and also as well as like physical strength and conditioning training. Um, and, you know, eventually um, Penn Charter, which is the high school I finished at, I did two years at Penn Charter. I did three years at St. Joe's Prep, two years at Penn Charter. They hired a strength and conditioning coach my, my senior year. And like to this point, I was, I was thinking I was going to go do physical therapy because in addition to being a mediocre athlete, I kept getting injured. Um, I just couldn't stay on the field. So I was like, this is pretty cool. You know, I'll help people rehab, help people get back on the field. Um, then I realized strength and conditioning was an actual field when they hired a strength coach at Penn Charter. And uh, I had the pleasure of following him around for my senior comprehensive project in high school. And basically we would just work out two, three hours a day and I would write about it. You know, it was, it was the best schoolwork I ever fucking did. It was, <laughs> it was so much fun. Um, <laughs> and that, and like, you know, as soon as I realized that was a career and you could do this for a living and get paid for it, you know, like lift weights and kind of shoot the shit at the, in the gym all day. Um, I was like, okay, screw physical therapy. I'm going to do this. This is way more fun. Uh, and that led to me studying clinical exercise science at Ithaca college. And, um, I did four years there. I did my internship at Cornell, which is like basically across the street. They're both in the town of Ithaca, New York. And, uh, I was able to, uh, I think it was my spring semester in my senior year, I got to work with a lot of the sports teams at Cornell, including football, wrestling, basketball. Uh, those are the teams I spent the most time with. Uh, simultaneously, like during the summers, I was going home and working at a sports performance gym that I had also interned at. Um, and I'll get into that later. But um, I, I was always, uh, I, think, I think a really important thing is just to be curious right? Like a lot of people just do the schoolwork, do the internships and, uh, you know, do the bare minimum. It's really important to just be curious and, and, um, you know, try to do your own research, not necessarily research, but just like, you know, whether it's watching YouTube videos of new exercises, or finding a mentor online to follow. Like for me, it was Joe DeFranco. I was constantly watching his stuff, um, constantly learning from him. And, and I, th I think that, uh, that curiosity is really what kind of springboarded everything. Um, so once I did the Cornell internship, I realized everybody there was kind of unhappy. Like they were all overworked, underpaid, and just constantly bitching about their situation. And I was like, all right, you know, I thought the college sector was the way to go, but these guys don't seem happy. This isn't the kind of life I want. 
Um, and you know, that might just be Cornell. Like it might not be everywhere. I don't want you guys to think that like every college strength coach is unhappy or I'm trying to say that, uh, it just ha- it just happened to be like my experience. And, uh, it was something I definitely wanted to avoid. Like, like I, I, I don't miss or don't, uh, envy the fact that a college strength coach has to explain to the soccer coach why his athletes aren't doing like sit-ups in the gym why they're not doing more abs or core work or sports specific work for the baseball players like I I I love having my own gym and being able to kind of do my own thing and not have to defend it to anybody (laughs) um so it was that was like one of the many things that the college strength coaches were kind of complaining about and I realized okay this isn't for me um like I said overworked underpaid it seemed and uh, I was like, okay, I got to do this in the private sector. And I'm going to find a way uh, to do what I love and also make a living doing it. Um, and then while I was working, while I was uh, interning at Cornell, I got a job at the place I had interned the prior summer. It was a sports performance gym in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. It, uh, it no longer exists, but basically the guy who owned it had promised me like 50K a year. He was like, you're, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're going to graduate, you're going to get 50K a year. It's going to be great. You're going to run my gym. And I was like, Oh, sounds good. You know, like that's, that's a lot of money in strength and conditioning, especially, you know, five, uh, five a year, how many years ago was that? Six years ago when I graduated college, I was like, sign me up. Like, let's do it. Um, I got there, I was making $13 an hour and I was only working like 20, 25 hours a week. So you do the math. That's, that's barely 20 K <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's basically I was promised all these things and it was, it was not even close. So I, I, I lasted there for like three months. Um, I was really unhappy, really un- upset that I hadn't like pursued other opportunities. Cause like when I was in college, I was like, you know, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home, work for this guy. And, uh, I'm going to run his gym. I'm going to get to train people. It's, and it's going to be my operation. It's going to be great. Um, meanwhile, I was watching him run his business and I learned exactly how not to run a business. Uh, this guy would disappear all day, you know, leave me, with everybody like I remember there's one time I was running a one-on-one personal training session I was running a group of 20 football players and then I was also doing an assessment with a 13 year old field hockey player that had just come in the gym and nobody like nobody else was there but me and, <laughs> and I still don't know how I got through that hour but I made it work um so like like I said this guy taught me how to uh you know think on my feet number one because there was constantly unexpected things happening, but also how not to run a business. And it, little did I know it was actually grooming me to run my own business and showing me exactly what I shouldn't do as a business owner, exactly how not to treat people. Um, eventually, you know, the last straw was like, I wasn't getting paid on time and the paychecks weren't that much. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I think my dad got in my ear and was like, you're basically running this guy's business. Why don't you just start your own? <laughs> And he was like, what do you have to lose? You know, you're just going to end up right back where you are right now. You're making 13 bucks an hour, 20 hours a week. How much worse can it get? And I was like, that's a good point. You know, what what do I have to lose? Um, So from there, you know, I think that day I called my former boss and was like, you know, I quit, man. This isn't working out. Uh, At the time, he had been like fighting with his business partner. So I was was like the least of his worries. He barely probably even noticed. Um, And I started G strength. I didn't like officially get an LLC until a year later, but I think it was August 1st of 2016. I started, I started like an, uh, on my personal Instagram, I started posting like motivational quotes and I went to old Navy and got some like blank, uh, gray t-shirts and got my logo printed on them. And, uh, you know, I had no clients. I was just acting like, you know, kind of, uh, faking it until I made it. Um, <laughs> It was, uh, and, I, and I, I was offering to um, train some of my, my high school buddies for free in their college basement. They had like an apartment on Drexel's campus. And I would go over there. We had like a squat rack. And I was like, look, I'm going to train you guys for free, three to five days a week. All we have to do is you follow my program, get results, and we're going to post them online so that people know I know what I'm talking about. And that's, that's really how G-Strength started. Um, I started to train people in my mom's development I was I sent out an email to like the entire development she lived in one of the or she still does live in one of those like 55 plus communities where they have like a pool they have one of those gyms she's out in collegeville uh 
right near the movie tavern and like they one day they delivered dumbbells and i was like oh shit like i can i can train people now like it's not just machines like this you know this this will work so i sent an email out got a couple responses the next day i had three clients i was training a husband and wife and then this other uh older lady who um you know they ended up doing a bunch of sessions with me and i remember taking that cash and immediately just buying a barbell and some bumper plates and and I just stored them in my mom's garage. I would like deadlift in my mom's garage because, you know, I didn't have a gym membership or anything anymore. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, it was fun. It was, it was so much fun because it was mine, you know, it was all my stuff and it felt really good to like, you know, just be doing my own thing and be independent. Um, where was I going with that? Eventually uh, I had to leave my mom's development because I, I knew long-term I wanted to be in Philly. So I rented an apartment. Um, from my dad actually <laughs> rented an apartment from my dad he gave me a discount but he still charged me 700 bucks a month which is pretty cheap considering i was in washington square a month i think the apartment probably should have been like 1400 or 1700 something like that um so i was paying him rent and i turned the bedroom into a, a gym so um you would walk into my apartment it'd be my bed a glass table like a, <laughs> a couch a kitchen and then the back room is my is my gym where I'm training one-on-ones and this lasted for like a year and a half meanwhile all this is going on from the day I quit I'm also driving Lyft Lyft helped me pay the bills I was probably spending more time driving Lyft from like Ju uh, July to February of 2016 and 2017 I was probably spending more time driving Lyft than I was actually training people um, February, 2017 is where it all changed. I really started to build a clientele. I think one of the best things I did was I Facebook messaged every single person I know on Facebook, like everybody, everybody I've ever met that I knew lived in Philly. I was like, Hey, I started a personal training business. Uh, do you, do you want personal training? Something to that extent. I was more detailed and more strategic and how I said things, but, um, that was the gist of the message. And a lot of former classmates responded and they supported me uh, whether it was from St. Joe's prep or Penn charter a lot of people I went to high school with or grade school with even um, started training with me and still train with me to this day um, eventually that grew into like 30 people coming into my apartment bedroom and training one-on-one -on -one with me some people would do two-on-ones we had some couples that would do two-on-ones but it was like a hundred 50 square feet better like bedroom it was tight there was a squat rack dumbbells and then a bunch of bands and some like knickknacks in the corner um but it was awesome it, it was unlike anything people had ever seen <laughs> i would say because i would like lie to people and not tell them it wasn't it, it wasn't a gym because i would just call it the facility <laughs> and they would, they would they would say things like does your facility have a bathroom i'd be like yeah my facility has a bathroom Meanwhile, it's just my apartment bathroom <laughs> or like locker room. They'd ask me if I have a locker room. It'd be, a, it'd be my bathroom. <laughs> I had one woman call me out. She came in. She was like, <laughs> she was like, oh, I didn't know I was going to be in your apartment. <laughs> and I just ignored the comment. I was like, well, the gym's right back here. And I just started showing her around the gym. And, you know, she was with me for three years after that. I couldn't, couldn't believe it. But um, people... I'm sure there was a bunch of people that came in, did assessments and never came back because they were creeped out by the whole thing. Uh, but a lot of people stayed and enough people stayed for me to, uh, to really get started. And the fact that my now fiance was living with me and usually there, it, um, it helped kind of tear the, the barriers down. Okay. He's not, you know, they're not, he's not an ax murderer. <laughs> There's somebody else here who trusts him. You know, maybe she's an ax murderer too, but hopefully not. Um, <laughs> so that, that lasted for like a year and a half. And then, um, in 2018, in February, March of 2018, I opened my gym in Queen village. And that's where the, the small group model started. So I guess my idea for this really came from my time at Cornell. I was working with the football team and I was like, oh, they got like four guys on a squat rack and they just have an Excel sheet on the rack and they just got guys running through. They're like a NASCAR pit crew, putting on plates, taking off plates. And, uh, you know, I was like, I could see how this could work in the private sector. Like, and that's where like the real idea 
came to me. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to run like a, like a workout of the day, like a wad, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, but it's going to be quality strength training. It's not going to be like a CrossFit, uh, but we're going to treat it a lot like a college weight, weight room. It's going to be a lot like a collegiate weight room setting, um, but for regular people. Uh, so, you know, that started and that was like nine people in a group with two coaches uh, for a long time. When it first started, it was just me and we didn't, we never had nine people because we were, you know, a smaller gym. But that Queen Village gym is about 750 square feet, which is tiny. It's, uh, you know, it looks like most people's one bedroom apartment. Uh, and uh, that eventually took off. I started hiring people. I started, you know, hiring clients to help me out in the beginning because I couldn't afford like people who, you know, actually did this for a living. Uh, eventually I brought on, uh, Tyler Curtis, who's our head strength and conditioning coach now. And, um, it really took off. We got to like a hundred people and I was like, let's just do another one. Let's open another one. I had, I had clients who, um, were redeveloping Harbison dairy in uh, Kensington and they had been reaching out to me like, yo, you need a bigger gym. We're going to have a commercial space over there. And I was like, I can't really move to Kensington because I have this clientele in Queen Village. Nobody's going to make the, the trip over there. Uh, but I can do a second one. It might, it might make sense to do a second one. And, uh, you know, I signed the lease in February of 2020 for that second location. If I knew this uh, pandemic was coming, I probably wouldn't have done it. So I'm, I'm both thankful and furious that it happened <laughs> that way. Um, because, you know, honestly, I, I would have backed out of it. And, uh, you know, the way things are now, things are good. I'm kind of, I'm glad I did do it. I'm glad I kind of pushed through and, and uh, stuck with it. Uh, because now we have about 150 clients between the two gyms and things are, things are starting to look up uh, both in the world and, and, uh, and, you know, within our gym. So, you know, growth is coming this fall and I'm really excited about that. We have, uh, yeah, we have, like I said, 150 people. And uh, now that the summer's over, I, I think a lot more people should be starting to roll into the gym. Um, yeah, I don't really know where to go from here. This is kind of like where we're at now. Um, I, th I think it'd be a good point to start answering questions. <laughs> no, most definitely, no, most definitely. I do have some questions for you myself, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on the ones that I wrote down just based off of what you was talking about. Um, I'm just gonna ask you questions off of that. Um, so while at Cornell, you said you, you know you had opportunity to work with different teams, different sports teams. What would you say? You know, what team would you say you you know you like working with the best? Oh, the wrestling team, hands down. Those guys Why, are right. because those guys are like Neanderthals. They they come in with like their hair sticking up. They're wearing two different socks. Their shirts on inside out. They just <laughs> <laughs> they're just yeah. They're like cavemen, and they just come in and crush it. Like like their assistant coach, I remember, didn't even warm up. Just like grabbed three sixty five off the rack and front squatted it for three. Like, who does that? There's <laughs> some, there's some head stuff, man. Yeah, it's stupid, but it's, like, impressive, too. I was like, wow, that's that, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's funny. That's funny. I mean, I, me, personally, I've never had an opportunity to work with wrestlers or anything along those lines, but that sounds real interesting. Um, so I know you I know you also talked and you mentioned COVID, right? And you mentioned that um, if you knew that COVID was coming, right? That you went in the, you would have backed out of your lease deal that you signed, right? So that being said, other than you know, you know, being other than you other other than you being hesitant, right? Knowing that if you knew that COVID would come, right? How would you say that you know COVID affected you positively and both negatively, you know, your business? Hmm. I mean, I mean, obviously it's a terrible thing. Um, we. I would say immediately just the fear uh, out of everybody was like traumatizing for me. Cause I was like, Oh my God, this business that I built is going to like die. You know, we, we went from making 15, $20,000 a month to we dropped as low as six in April. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to keep, it was me and Ty at that point. So I was like, I don't know how I'm going to keep paying Ty, keeping him on. I don't know how I'm going to, you know, eat myself. Um, luckily, I had some savings to kind of get through it. I was like, but now there was a point where I was like, how long is this going to go? How long, you know, am I going to be able to uh, keep cash in the bank account so that the business can stay alive and last through this? 
because I, I mean, I don't know if you remember back to like that time in April, May, where they just kept pushing it back, pushing it back. Can't open, can't open. I remember. Um, you know, that, that, that was really, that was really tough. It was really, it was really hard to, uh, with no end in sight, with no light at the end of the tunnel, it was really hard to stay motivated and it was really hard to figure out ways uh, to spend my time efficiently. So something we did immediately was we, we, we made like a no gym, no problem program on team builder. And uh, we sold it for like 25 bucks a pop. And we made like 2000 bucks the first week COVID started. Um, we, me, me and uh, Ty were just kind of cranking, cranking on that for like the first two weeks. And then we were like, Oh shit, what are we going to do when this is over? You know, <laughs> and then, so then we went to Zoom, started doing Zoom workouts, which are terrible. I don't know if you've ever run one. They suck. They're not fun to run. Um, and about a month in, people started losing interest because they're not physically there with you. They're not lifting heavy weights. It's just like, you know, there's only so many push-ups and, you know, Bulgarian split squats you can do on your couch <laughs> with your cat <laughs> before, you know, there's a ceiling. There's a ceiling of what you can do. And, uh, you know, it gets boring really fast. So, you know, we, we struggled through the first couple months like that, you know, just trying to keep the business afloat, doing everything we can. And then, uh, you know, to be honest, we opened illegally in May. We, uh, we had a lot of demand from members. They were just like, look, you know, just open, we'll come. And we had about 40 people come back in May, which is about two months, um, two months early. In July, I think July 7th was when, uh, gyms were allowed to open so what we did was we blacked out uh, the windows and we you know we, we only had three people in there um, we, we you know we were still doing the social distancing thing we, we were basically doing everything that we thought was the right move you know like like they were letting people go into Home Depot do all these other things and uh, I was like how is this unsafe we have we have a bunch of people coming to our gym that give a shit about their health you know, everybody's being cautious. Um, we, we would have one coach, three people in our gym, as opposed to the nine people we had prior to the pandemic. So we, we cut our class size in a third and we ran like that until the seventh. Uh, I don't think we were wearing masks in the beginning because it wasn't mandated yet. Uh, but as soon as they mandated it and allowed gyms to open, we followed suit. We just, we, we, throughout the whole thing, we did what we were supposed to do with the exception of like closing for those two months and then we just, we stayed open. We, we, we haven't closed since. I know they closed gyms in December from Thanksgiving until New Year's of last year. We, we stayed open through that as well. Um, just because we didn't, again, we didn't feel like what we were doing was wrong. Um, we felt we were being grouped in with larger gyms like, um, you know, LA Fitness with like hundreds of people in the gym using the same equipment. We, you know, we were doing everything that we, you know, we thought was right. And, and uh, our clients agreed it. I think a big thing that um, that I realized during the pandemic was like people trust us and that is worth its weight in gold. Trust is like the most important thing in business. People have to believe in you, like believe that you're doing the right thing and believe that you're going to protect them and do right by them. Um, but they also have to believe in your product enough to, to kind of take that leap. Right. Um, I will say uh, aside from the scary things, you know, I, I, I was terrified every day. I was either going to get shut down or fined during all that. We had blacked out the windows of both gyms. So, so theoretically you couldn't see in. Um, but, you know, I was rolling the dice every day, expecting a thousand, three thousand dollar fine. Um, just because I, I knew that, you know, staying open was kind of worth it. Like it really only takes, you know, if you're making 15,000 a month, 20,000 a month, it really takes a week to kind of make up that fine. So every week I was open, I was like, okay, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to be able to pay this back. Um, the, the, some of the positives that came out of COVID, I would say the whole time we're doing this, Ty is just improving our program. He's the, our head strength and conditioning coach. He's like the director of programming. He's on team builder, learning the ins and outs of team builder. He created different tiers to our program so that, you know, somebody who's a beginner, and somebody who's a, like a semi-professional athlete can train in the same room and do this, do a similar program with different progressions and regressions. Um, and we also just kind of honed in on our business model. Like I was saying before, two people, two coaches, nine members, we changed now to one coach, six members, which is a much more profitable 
uh, business model. We raised our prices. Um, we used to make everybody do the same workout. Now we allow all six people to do different things. So those are some positives that came out of it. We, de we definitely came out of it with a, um, a much better product. And um, luckily, you know, while this is all happening, the government kind of helped out with some, some money and, and you know, some aid. Uh, keeping tie on actually ended up helping me. They had something come out called the Paycheck Protection Program, where they almost like refunded me for a few months of paying an employee throughout all this, not making them go on unemployment. Um, so there, there was a lot of support uh, from both our members and, uh, you know, the community for not snitching on us, even though I'm sure, you know, <laughs> there's a UPS like right next to us and there's like a line there because they're only allowing two people, uh, two people in there at a time. And, you know, I'm sure people saw other people going in and out of our gym and no one called the cops or, you know, at least, <laughs> at least they never got to us. <laughs> But um, it was a scary time, and I'm, you know, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad to be almost through it. I know it's not done yet, but you know, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, man, it definitely was a scary time, man. Um, I mean, I'm glad everything worked out for me. Um, I definitely want to ask though, like, you know, you seem like you're very informed and on the business on the business spectrum of things, but I ain't really hear you touch base on like you know any like you no know, formal education or business. And I know things must have been like, you know, really nerve wracking, you know, through COVID, just having to do everything on the back end of the business. So I want to know like a little bit about how that was and like, you know, how did you cope and you manage with that? And, you know, if you needed to seek out information, who did you turn to or, you know, what source did you turn to, you know, for guidance? So I would say, you know, I've, I've had a couple of mentors from that on that side of things. My dad, uh, is an entrepreneur himself. He owns a, a dental practice in the city. At one point, he had four different practices, I think in Atlantic City, South Philly. Um, I think there was two in South Philly and then one was maybe in Jersey somewhere else. I don't know. He only has one now at Ninth and Christian, but he uh, basically, like, like I said, the guy who I worked for told me how not to run a business. My dad kind of taught me the ins and outs of like how to treat people, how to keep people coming and uh, how to, you know, how to just how to always do right by your client and run a really respectable business and, you know, do things the right way. Um, and then I also, I'm a part of a mastermind uh, for gym owners. It's called the SPF mastermind it stands for simple, profitable fun. And it's run by Vince Gabriel. I know he, uh, he speaks on the, the perform better circuit and uh, the uh, strength coach podcast every week. He's, he's probably one of the, you know, he's the best, if not one of, you know, one of the best um, as far as fitness business goes right now. And uh, he's actually a Temple alum. You might want to, I don't know if, he, I don't know if he's big, he's, he might be too big time for this, but uh, he might be, a hey, good he played, played on the football team. Um, hey man, if you don't, if you don't mind, you know, writing his name in the chat, I'll screenshot that and I would love to reach out to him, you know. Yeah, sure, I'll do conversation. that. Uh, Yeah, he's the man. Um, it, it, like, even if you don't get to have him speak, I would just watch some of his stuff. He's got so much valuable content on like how to run a fitness business. Um, how do I close this? Uh, so he runs a mastermind with like 50 to 60 gym owners across the country. And we all, um, the concept of a mastermind is like, you know, you're only so smart by yourself, but together you can come up with like all these ideas and all these solutions to different problems. And the awesome part about being in that is because I'm, I'm only 28 years old. Um, everybody else in this, in this gym owner mastermind has been owning a gym for like five to 30 years. So they've seen problems that I haven't even thought of yet. And they're almost like, I'm able to kind of stand on the shoulders of giants because like, I just, I see the problems before they happen and I have solutions before I even know I have the problem, right? Um, I could always turn to one of them for help. I think, you know, the gym was kind of dead in August. August is typically a, a dead month. So we went up to a gym called Varsity House, um, brought the whole staff, and they taught us basically what they do and uh, kind of peeled, peeled back the curtain for a little bit and taught us about their operation and how they run their gym. I would look them up too. They have like a massive facility. It's like 10,000 square feet and they have like a 30 yard field outside too. It's 
pretty awesome gym. What's the name again? Varsity House. Varsity House. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just having guys like that in the group um, really helps. You know, like these guys are constantly coming up with ideas. There's a lot of creative individuals in the group uh, when it comes to marketing and stuff like that. We very rarely talk training, to be honest with you. Um, it's mostly like, how do you, how do you run a profitable fitness business? Because at the end of the day, like we we're all nerds when it comes to that stuff. We probably know all know enough to serve our, our population. You know, like how much do you really need to know to train general population clients more, more strength and conditioning knowledge isn't necessarily going to grow your business or keep you in business. Um, so a lot of the stuff he teaches us is stuff that meatheads don't know. <laughs> That's and that's why we pay to be a part of the group. Uh, so th those two things, I would say, my dad and just finding a mentor in uh, in Vince Gabriel, who's like specific to the fitness industry, because the issues the issues that I was running into with my dad was like, yeah, that's for dental offices, like that works for dental offices, that works for real estate, but you've never owned a gym, it's a little different. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let me get help from somebody who's actually doing what I'm doing, and I think that's the great part about Vince is that he actually still runs a gym. Uh, called Gabriel Fitness and Performance up in uh, North Jersey. It's Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Yeah, man, that's that's really cool. And that's um, really cool. And that's great that, you know, you found that such, like, you know, I would say an early stage in, you know, your progression of your business. So that's really dope. Um, I do have, you know, two questions that I wrote down, right? Yeah. But I do want to ask you one more question before I get to those questions and, you know, give the opportunity to Sean as well, too, to see if he wanted to ask any questions. Um, so the question I did want to ask was, I heard you mentioned, you know, earlier about, I don't know exactly what, specifically said, what you specifically said, but you mentioned the general population, right? And I wanted to know, would you, if you had, if you had, you know, if you had it your way, would you prefer to work with athletes or the general population or, you know, let's say geriatrics, because in a sense, you know, Older people are always, you know, all, older older people are always like when it comes to training them. There's different than training just the general public. I think I think my favorite type of person to work with is the exact reason I started the business. I love that quote, like, "Be who you needed." It goes something along the lines of, "Be who you needed when you were younger," like, "Be the solution to the problem you needed solved when you were younger," or something like that. Um, so again, when I was like eighth grade beginning of high school, I was you know, short, chubby, unathletic. I was trying to play sports. Um, I wish I had uh, Jeff Dorito, the strength coach at Penn Charter, when I was in eighth grade versus my senior year of high school. Um, I don't know if I you know, would have really done anything of, of merit in athletics <laughs> regardless, but you know, it really would have been awesome to have him earlier on. So I would say just working with that age – Working with that age, that 13 year old that's kind of like awkward, has no confidence, like doesn't know what the hell they're doing, doesn't know their, <laughs> you know, how to move their body in space, essentially. Um, and just kind of, you know, number one, giving them confidence, helping them get stronger, and really changing their life from, from that standpoint. Um, I think that's the coolest person to work with for me. Oh, that's, that's dope. There's a, lot of, a lot of change you can make at that age, I feel. Like, like I watch people, I watch probably 10 to 20 kids like that grow up in my gym. And uh, that's only, it's only been six years. It's only been five or six years. So uh, I think that's so cool. I too, I feel like I could definitely relate. Um, one of the reasons why I got into, you know, strength coaching myself was because of different coaches that I had an opportunity to work with growing up. And they just inspired me and, you know, just always encouraged me to just, you know, progress and just try to achieve, like, higher. And I, to myself, I played sports up until the collegiate year, but I suffered from injuries. So, you know, I had to change my path of what I wanted to do. But that's besides the point, though. Um, I'm going to get I'm gonna give Sean the floor if he has any questions to ask. Sean? Yeah, I got a, I got a quick question. First off, I just want to say I respect your tenacity and your work ethic and drive for, I mean, like you went from literally a room in your apartment to your own gym. So I want to say I respect that. I mean, you probably, it's probably the time when you get a second just to uh, stool yourself a little pat on the back. 
But what I got to say or ask, at least, is like during the moments, I guess I, w- I guess you could call them dark moments compared to where you are now in retrospect. Like, did you ever think about like giving up? Like, what you ever have like a, just a rough day and you train someone in that back room in your apartment and you're just like, damn, is this going to work out for me? Do I need to switch my path? Like, you ever have that feeling or you like were single handedly like you knew it was going to work no matter what and you didn't even like go back into that side of your mind? Yeah, I would say the crazy part is like, I was, I got to the point where I was working like 12 to 16 hour days, five days a week or yeah, five days a week in my apartment bedroom. Um, and I always, I was so in love with the vision of having my own gym that I never, never doubted for a second that it was going to all work out. That's um, awesome. I think, I think that's so important is just having a clear, having a clear vision and you know, knowing what you want um, and just going after it. Um, because like that got me up every morning when I didn't feel like getting up. I was like, you know what? I got to just keep pushing because there's a, there's a pot of gold at the end of this or, you know, whatever. Uh-huh, whatever. I feel you. Uh, metaphor, you motivation comes <laughs> out. Discipline um, comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to um, that. I will say I did have a couple of those moments where, um, where I felt like quitting. I, there, there was a weird moment when I finally got the gym in Queen Village where like, I, I opened the gym. My, I think my mom sent me like balloons or some shit and they're like hanging in the gym. I have a 6 a.m. client. I have a small group class, but only one person signed up and that person oversleeps. And <laughs> I remember just like looking around like, yeah, I got this fancy gym. You know, it looks awesome. It's everything I ever wanted, but I still have the same problems. <laughs> I thought, mm-hmm. You know, I kind of went into it thinking like all my all my all the world's problems or all my problems were kind of going to go away once I had this gym, and uh, it it made me it, it made me kind of uh, look like reflect on okay okay I need to I need to love the process and that's what I've done all along, but I, I need to I need to not um, fall in love with that end result because once you get there once you reach your goals it's still it, <laughs> it's not going to change much right like everybody. I think people associate that with fitness. They're like, oh, once I have that six, those six pack abs, I'm going to be happy and my life's going to be complete. <laughs> you know, for me, that was like, sure. I was like, I was like, I'm going to open my own gym and you know, then I'm going to be like, everything's going to be great. You know, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to, I'm going to have so much money. And it's going to be awesome. It's like, no, you still got to figure your shit out. You still got to, you, know, you got to be happy first. You got to love the process. You got to make sure you love what you're doing every day. And, um, you know, and then you will truly feel successful um the <laughs> the other time i would say i felt like giving up was was during covid i would say that that hasn't really gone away <laughs> I, would say, I would say from march until now i still have those thoughts every day i'm like damn yeah they could just they could just shut me down again anytime <laughs> like, and you know I, I don't think they actually will but it's just it's scary to think about it's scary to think about like everything you've worked you've worked for and um, I know, I know there's a very small minded outlook on, on a pandemic. I know people are dying and there's much bigger problems you know, than, than my gym, but it just sucks. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. It sucks. It's like, no, rightfully so. I mean, you're a business <laughs> owner, like you have things to provide for, you have bills to pay as well. Yeah. So I, I would say it, it, it's, um, I, most of my thoughts are positive, but, but there, that does creep in every now and then it's like, it's like, damn, uh, you know, I hope this doesn't happen again. <laughs> interesting, interesting fact, right? Sean is actually, he's actually a business major. So that question that he just asked is an excellent question, yeah. honestly. So I just wanted to condone you on that question. Sean, that was a great question. Thank you, bro. All right, um, I'm going to ask my two questions that I have ruled down. Sure. So my first question I asked was, what is one of your most adverse obstacles you faced while building your gym slash brand G strength? But I feel like you already answered that. If you want to touch on it a little bit more, right? But I feel like you definitely answered that when um, you touched base on the aspect of COVID. But if you do want to touch on it a little bit more, you go right, go right ahead. Yeah, I would say, um, hmm. Biggest obstacles. Yeah, the pandemic's definitely been a big test, but I would say prior to that, it's probably just you know I I think 
I think the mental side of things is, is always something you have to constantly be working on. Like I was saying before, I, I kind of associated success with like, oh, I got my own gym. And I reached my goals very young. And I was still like, I was probably 20, I was 24 when I opened Queen Village. And um, I, I was like, okay, now what? You know? <laughs> um, and for a while, I, I, I kind of like, I lost my way a little bit. I was like, what am I doing? What, what is this all for? What's the end goal? Um, and like I was saying, like it, it, was, it was very outcome. My, my happiness was very associated with the right outcomes and not necessarily the process. So I would say that's, that's something I'm constantly working on. It's, it's never going to be perfect, but um, uh, it's going to sound arrogant, but I have this problem where I keep achieving my goals <laughs> and then I don't know what to do next. And I don't, um, Yeah, I, I, th I think I think I think the obstacle is, is is learning to enjoy the ride, learning to appreciate the process, have fun with what you're doing, be where you are right now, and, and don't lose sight of that. Um, you know, there are going to be goals accomplished in the process, but you know, getting those things, making more money, having more gyms, isn't necessarily going to make you happier. You know, and. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad that happened to me early on because um, I think a lot of people waste a lot of time chasing things that aren't actually going to make them more complete or more fulfilled, uh, give them more purpose. You know, I, I've been, I've been, as soon as that happened, when I opened my, my gym and somebody stood me up, I've been kind of in, in search of, of more fulfillment, more purpose and doing things that make me happier versus like, again, bigger gyms, more gym, which is why I haven't opened like a super, mega center in the city yet um because i'm able to kind of do my thing and be happy in these tiny closets <laughs> i think my my kensington gym's 1300 square feet so double the size of queen village but yeah that's dope definitely like you know how we sit here in philadelphia um in relation to the sixers trust the process man you gotta trust the process <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they've kind of ruined that saying for me, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very true. You have to uh, learn about the process, fall in love with the process. Um, yeah, yeah, I, day, like, that, but I think the most, I think I, I, so at the end of the day, the process is really all you have. Um, yeah, I, I think I think at the at the end of the day, like you you, you have to love work too. Like you're going to spend five out of every seven days doing it. You might, it might as well be doing something that, that, you, that you really enjoy. <laughs> I'm happy to say that, that I do. I'm lucky enough to be in that position. I'm sorry. I'm going to finish off my last question. And I will ask Sean again if he has anything else that he wants to um, time in or add. All right. So as a strength coach, what would you say you like more about the career? Well, I should say as a strength coach and an entrepreneur, what would you say you love more about the career? The implementation of programs and relationships you develop when coaching or the science behind programming and the program and the physiology behind it? Uh, I would say 100 percent the you know the coaching, the relationships you build. I think I think there's nothing better. Um, and I really learned to appreciate that when the pandemic hit, when I didn't see people in person for like two, two or three months. And uh, I, I, I've, I've started to kind of delegate a lot of the training. I've gotten to the point where I, I run probably eight hours of, of classes a week, um, whereas the rest of my coaching staff is doing anywhere from 15 to 25 sessions a week. And um, if I don't, have that in my life, I feel very incomplete, right? If I'm not training anybody, if I'm not, you know, helping somebody reach their goals, or if I'm not, um, if I don't have that like face-to-face -face interaction uh, where I'm like fostering a relationship, it's, it's just not the same, you know? Like, like I've had weeks where all I do is like business improvement stuff, but if I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm not coaching, if I'm not on the floor with people, it's, it's just not the same for me. So I, I would say, you know, you know, training and coaching and, and, and working with people is my favorite part of the job. And 
Um, I hope that I never have to stop doing that. <laughs> I, th I know every, every business coach will tell you that like the end goal is to be like separated from the operation, not do anything. That's how you like really know you've, you've, you've started a business and not just a job. Um, but I, I would like to maintain a certain number of hours of training every week, just because I love it so much. I love working with people and helping people. No, that's, that's really, that's really cool, man. Um, Sean, do you have any, 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 any questions you want to ask? Uh, no, I don't. All right, man. I thank both of you guys for hopping on and just taking the time out of your day to come on and just chat with me. I was expecting a larger crowd, but you know, so be it. I mean, I feel like we had a good conversation today and I got some good takeaways. Um, I know somebody that I would be searching up um, that you wrote in the chat and I'll be trying to reach out to him and see if I can get him to come on. I mean, like you said, it, he yeah. might be a little bit big time for this, but it doesn't hurt reaching out to him, you know, trying to just get some knowledge from people in the field, you know, that like you mentioned earlier with um, the business group that you're in, being able to step on the shoulder of the Giants, you know what I mean? I wouldn't be in that position. I wouldn't be in that position. So I'm continue just trying to reach out to different people and just trying to communicate with them. Yeah. Um, I would definitely yeah. mention that you're a Temple uh, student and, um, if nothing else, I bet he would send some of his books to you guys. He's got a uh, bunch of really good books on like fitness business stuff. So uh, it's definitely somebody I would definitely be reaching out to. Yeah. Thank um, you, by the way. I appreciate it. I learned a few things. I enjoyed the convo a lot, actually. Of course. Of course. Happy to do it. Hopefully people listen to it and enjoy it on the recording as well. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Well, with that being said, guys, um, I wish you guys a very, you know, great rest of your night. And a great rest of your week, and you guys really enjoy your weekend. Thanks again, G, right. for coming on and really talking to us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, have a great night. Thank you. Take care, fellas. All right, guys.